If you have your Bibles today, do me a favor and turn to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis today. Book of Genesis. If you don't know where Genesis is at, that's the uh, first book of the Bible. Just open your Bible up and you'll find it right there. Book of Genesis. And, and here's what I want you to do. Turn to the book of Genesis. And then also, you know you have that little string thingy? You know that little string thingy hangs off your Bible, that little, that little ribbon? Will you mark the, uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2? Because we're going to flip over there also. And we'll be at the last part of Acts. But let's start in Genesis chapter 1 today. And we're going to look at a very interesting story. Uh, and, and, and today, my question I'm asking everyone is this. I'm asking you this question. Who's your one? Who's your one? We are going to start challenging everyone at our church to become the evangelist you're called to be. And, and, and I, got a, I got a little secret for you. Everyone has a gift they're called to. And so it's easy to say, well, some people are called to be pastors, teachers, preachers, evangelists. But what I'm talking about this is, you know, when Jesus ascended, he actually gave us instructions. His last instructions were make disciples of all the earth. And when he said that, he didn't say, pastors make disciples of all the earth. Okay? In other words, you don't have to have the title evangelist today. You don't have to have the title pastor today. You don't have to have the title prophet today. You don't have to have the title teacher today. You don't have to have a doctorate. You don't have to be college educated. You can be old or young you can be whatever you need to be because all of us have been called to make disciples of the world. Which is why last week when we talked, we said the four friends who were incredible brought their friends to Jesus. But since Jesus died on the cross and has left us the Holy Spirit, we now bring Jesus to our friends. This week, I want to tell you why after, if you're going to walk the, this Jesus lifestyle, we're called the walk, where we're bringing Jesus to our friends, the next step is we need to start bringing people to the church. And not because Jesus is at the church waiting for people to show up. He's in you. He's waiting for you to do the life you're called so that Jesus can be seen in the world. But we want to start bringing people together because it's a place they can come and experience the unity of being the bride of Christ. See, when you get adopted into God's family, follow me on this because this might, I don't want to confuse anyone. Just make sure you're following me today, okay? When you ask Christ into your heart, okay, the Spirit of God begins to indwell in your life. Holy Spirit is the reason you knew you needed Him. When you ask Jesus into your life, you are now called a son of God. Now, if you're offended by being called the son of God, uh, let me finish this because I'll offend everyone equally, okay? Now, the cool thing about being a son of God is it means that you're grafted into God's family. Your last name gives you rights to your father's inheritance, to his rulership, to everything that you need on this planet. All of your stuff is going to come because you are being made a son. You've been grafted in to the family of God today. But here's the great thing. We also get the opportunity to do something more than just be sons. Sons walk in high levels of authority, right? Sons have access. Sons never have to set up an appointment to hang out with their dads. Y'all know that? No matter who their dad is. No matter who your dad is. If your dad's the president, you don't make an appointment to go see the president. If your dad's the king of some country, you don't have to make an appointment. You are a son. There's an open invitation to you. But the beautiful thing is, you also get the opportunity to be a bride. And real quick, I want to explain to you what it means to be a bride in the kingdom of God. See, a son has access, but a bride has even more access. My son has access to everything in the house, but he often has to ask for it. Right? If he wants to get something out of the fridge, he has to come to me and go, Dad, can I have something out of the fridge? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Or no, not right now. Right? But do you think my wife ever has to come to me and say, hey, can I have something out of the fridge? No. No, in fact, the fridge is hers, okay? I'm not. <laughs> Men, are you ever going to tell your wife uh, they shouldn't eat something out of the fridge? Uh, not if you want to live a long, happy, married life, right? Um, if you don't mind uh, black eyes and uh, painful marriages, go ahead. Do what you want to do. You do you, boo-boo. 
But what I'm saying is what happens is when the church gets unified, we become the bride. And in the brideship, we walk in even greater levels of authority. The church in our day right now desperately needs to become unified. And here's the thing I'm going to tell you right now. It's not that everyone in the church is going to become unified. It's that God is going to raise up a holy bride who will become a part of that, that will chase after holiness, that will chase after God's affections and God's approval instead of man's approval. What we're going to look at is we're going to see a separation of churches as things get harder and harder. And what we'll find is there's going to be two churches that come up. And the church we want to be a part of is the church that's solely focused on pleasing our Father and making Him proud and doing what He's called us to do. That is going to be the remnant church. And when we, the remnant church, rise up and become unified in vision and in heart, we won't agree on everything, guys, but we can agree on the major things that matter. Jesus is Lord. He's given us the Holy Spirit to empower us, and we're called to be ambassadors of the kingdom right now, right here, and we're going to do it. That'll make us the remnant church. Let me show you something powerful behind this today, okay? And, and I'm asking you this because i got a question I want you to be thinking about right now. In fact, I'm going to ask you the question right now. Who is your one? I want to challenge every family here and every person here to make up your mind that you're going, you're going, to, make, you're going to make a family or a person your new focus, See, a lot of us, the reason we're afraid to bring people to church or to talk about the church or any of these pieces, the reason we're so afraid of it is because we think we have to have some sort of gotcha argument that's going to win them over to Christ. And let me help some people out. Do you know what God's actually calling the church to do in this season? What if, follow me on this, you befriended someone who needs to come to church. And instead of making your focus, can I get them to come to church, your focus is, can I be Jesus to them to the point that my life reflects it so much that they want what I have? When I was in college working on my business degree, one of our professors taught world religion, and uh, he brought in a Muslim imam, a religious leader of, of, the, of uh, the Muslim mosque. And, and as they were talking, one of the things that they said was, they said some of the reasons people are so afraid of Muslims in America right now is because Muslims who live in America for long points, he said it was like 70% of Muslims who live in America for long term have never been invited to eat dinner in anyone's house who's not a Muslim. Now, that accusation can go both ways, you know, they should do better to reach out, but come on, guys. We get an opportunity to do something powerful. You can actually use your dining room table as a place of evangelism right now. See, and doesn't that seem easier to just invite people to come to your house and to do life with you and to, and to pray over your food and to, and to be a blessing to people around you, to be available to love on people. And when they ask you questions, be bold in your answers. Why do you do that? Because Jesus is king and I do what he calls me to do. Because I'm blessed and highly favored. Because, because I love the Lord. Where do you go on Sundays? I go to church. As you build friendships, all of a sudden you're going to be able to bring people in. And so what I want to challenge people to do is I want you in this season to ask yourself, Who's your one? Ask Holy Spirit, who's my one? If you're a family here today, I want you to say, God, who's the family I'm called to be the light to, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my focus this year. And I'm going to get this family to attend church and know who Jesus is this year, even if it means it's not Hope City Church. Ooh, how about that? I don't care what church you get them to, just get them to a church. Here's the cool thing. If you'll act out what God is calling you to act out in the marketplace, in your homes, you're going to find that people are going to be curious about what's going on anyways, right? And so the question is, who's the one? So ask Holy Spirit, who's my one? Families, adopt a family. If you don't have a family that you're just solo, adopt a person. Ask God to put the person or the family on your heart you need to reach this, this, this year. And make that your focus. Not that you're going to get them, okay? We're not getting anyone. We're giving life to people. We don't have to trick anyone into the kingdom of God. All we have to do is live out the kingdom principles in front of them and let them see our lives in action. We don't have to pretend to be perfect in front of them. This will help a lot of people out too. Do you know one of the greatest things you can do is just be who you are and say sorry when you mess up? That will get rid of the idea that Christians are hypocrites when we all apologize when we mess up. And we show the world, hey, God is forgiving, and we can ask for forgiveness. 
Ready? So this is where we're going to go, and today I want to talk about this unity idea. So follow me in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11, and I'm going to look at a strange story, guys, that really messes with me, and, uh, and, and it's, it's so interesting, and, and really there's so much depth to it. But let's go, it's the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. It says, and the whole earth had one language and the same words, already interested. How amazing it is that you can get stuff together done when you have one language and you all speak the same words. I'm going to come back to that, but I want you to focus on that right now. If you all have, if we speak in one language and one words, you know, a lot of the problems we have in our communication today is, is like text, we don't all speak the same words. When we're typing something in email, we don't all speak the same words. And so it's easy for people to misread us and mishear us, Right. As the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in Shiner and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. For, uh, and they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar, which is a, a tar substance that comes from petroleum. You know, they were in the Middle East when they were building. The petroleum would actually ooze up out of the ground and would leave like this tarry, uh, petroleum substance that they would use as mortar, and when they'd place these bricks on top of it, as the petroleum would uh, evaporate out of it, it would harden just like asphalt. So really what they're building is bricks and asphalt to build this huge tower. This is some high-tech technology for their time, isn't it? In fact, it's, what's interesting about this is this shows that they're capable of doing things, and often in our lives we're capable of doing things and we think that because we're capable of doing something, we're called to do it. Let's let that sink in for a second. Then they said, come let us build a city uh, for, or build ourselves a city and a tower on top into the heavens. Well, that sounds like trouble already, isn't it? And let us make a name for ourselves. Inside of this, they've said ourselves and us a whole bunch. Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, the reason they're saying unless we get uh, distributed and, and spread out over the whole world, they're saying we're comfortable, we have the knowledge, we can do this. Let's build a, a name and a tower for ourselves so that we stay comfortable with the technology and the understanding we have. But the problem is the reason they know they're going to be scattered into the world is because in Genesis chapter 9, the Lord has given instruction to Noah and his sons and his family, go and spread the descendants all over the world. In other words, the Lord is saying, go dominate the entire earth, spread out over all the earth, keep bringing dominion everywhere you go. And the people are saying, but together right now, we're more comfortable. Why should we listen to God when we can make ourselves a God? The reason they're building a tower into the heavens is because they believe the gods lived up in the mountains. They're building a structure that represents the place they believe God lives in so they can themselves raise themselves up at the level of God. Because they choose comfort and knowledge and the known pieces and the comfort of knowing each other over the obedience to be doing what God's called them to do. Do y'all follow me today? You see the choices? The choices stay comfortable and be disobedient. Rest in your own knowledge and make yourself a God. Or make God king of everything. Make him dominion over your life. The king of everything. Obey him. Go into the wilderness at times. And make, make yourself, you know, spread out as you're called, but bring forth the kingdom to all the planet. But it means that sometimes you're going to be spread out a little more alone, isn't it? So they're choosing comfort and their own knowledge to build their own name rather than obey God. And this is going to be a problem, isn't it? The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children had built, or which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people. So what does that mean? They're in unity. They have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose to do will be impossible for them now. Come, let us go down and confuse their languages so that they may not understand one another's speech. So what is going on? He literally says, that when man, even if they're not following God, even when they're living evil lives, even when they're doing their own thing, when they choose to get into unity, when they choose to walk in unity, 
they literally have the ability to do almost anything they want to do. I'm, I'm, let me pose something to you today. That almost says to me that a unified group of unbelievers is more powerful than, than Christians who refuse to get into unity together. And I would even go as far as to say that the spirit of Babylon lives on today. Because anytime we see Christians who are mocking other Christians in front of non-believers, you're only bringing about more disunity and you're walking in the spirit of Babel, which says, let's make a name for ourselves. The only reason Christians would feel the need to put down other Christians and to tell people who they are would simply because they don't understand what God's called them to do. They're called to walk in unity. Does that mean we can never disagree? No. It doesn't mean that. But it means our disagreements, maybe we should handle it differently and be careful of who we disagree in front of, right? Right now on Facebook, there's a lot of disagreements being said about people, and nobody's actually talking face-to-face -face and worried about the effect it's having. Let's be careful that we don't let the spirit of Babel cause us to be divided today. And so what does the Lord do? And this is the interesting thing that happens. And he says... And uh, so come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. And the Lord dispersed them all over the face of the earth. And they left the building, uh, they left off building the city. And they went through and, and, and throughout, and, and therefore it was known as, that that area is called Babel. Because the Lord confused the languages all over the earth. Let me talk to you the importance about being in unity in speech. And, and I want to help some people out. We have brothers and sisters all around the world who speak different languages. Right? No one disagrees about that. We have brothers and sisters all around the United States that speak different dialects of English. I mean, some of y'all listen to us in Oklahoma. You, you can hear my Oklahoma dialect, right? I throw in y'all. We go out to New Jersey. They're going to say, use guys. I don't know if that's what they say. I don't know. If you're out in New Jersey, please, Texas, let us know what's going on, okay? But you see, we, don't, we, we may have one language, but we don't speak the same words, do we? But here's what's interesting. The Lord is showing us in this that unity is a powerful force that, that causes, uh, you know, entire cultures to shift. And, and what I would say today is we are being invited in to walk in unity. That first scripture I read when I first came up in Zephaniah 3, 9, it says, for that time, now watch this. For Zephaniah 3, 9, it says, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech so that all of them may be called upon the name of the Lord and serve him in one accord. Now, what I want to show you is this. I truly believe that right now we live in a day and age where the Lord has empowered us to once more speak one language together in the same words. I believe the same words we're called to speak are the words found in Scripture. They're the promises we're called to speak. And, and I want to show you the language today that I think is going to help us out. I want to show you what happened. So after Jesus comes to earth, remember I, always, I talk about this a lot, but he says, it's good that I'm leaving you because I'm going to send you a helper. As he's leaving, he says, go make disciples all over the world, which is why we are going to choose who's our one, let the Holy Spirit guide us, and begin to reach out to people and build relationships with them because we want them to come to the knowledge of who Jesus is. But before he left, Jesus said, I want you to go up into an upper room. I want you to go up into an upper room, and I want you to pray until you receive an infilling of the Holy Spirit, until you receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus explains to the disciples and those who were watching him ascend, all of his disciples at that point, I want you to go up into an upper room and I want you to pray until you receive an empowerment of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, after, you know, days and days and days and weeks of praying, a powerful thing happens. The people were celebrating, uh, they, were, they were celebrating this, this Jewish festival the, 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 the disciples of Jesus were up in an upper room with no windows. And all of a sudden, as they're praying, the infilling of the Holy Spirit comes over them like tongues of fire, which is already a supernatural event. Y'all, 
I want to pray in my life so hard and have such an encounter with the Holy Spirit that firefighters show up at this building. How dope would that be? If in the morning when you're praying in your closet, you're a fi- you know, fire people, you know, like the, the truck shows up at five in the morning right outside your house because the neighbors have been reporting. There's a strange glow happening in there. I don't know if it'll happen or not, but why not pray and see, you know, chase after it. But they have tongues of fire show up over their head. And then it says they all begin to speak in different languages that are understood, that are understood by all the people from all over the world who are practicing Jews in the town of Judea or Jerusalem at that time in order to celebrate. And all of a sudden they're hearing their language proclaim who Jesus is and what he's done. And these people are speaking languages they don't know. Now watch this, because here's the thing. Let me ask you this question. At the Tower of Babel, and, and, and further back than that, so Tower of Babel, there's Noah, there's Enoch, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve. What language do they speak? This is a trick question, because the story about them is recorded in Hebrew, because a Hebrew speaker, a Hebrew author was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it, but what language did Adam and Eve speak? What language? I don't, I can't tell you the name of it, but I'll say this. They spoke the language of God. Now, no, 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 pay attention to this. Now watch this. This matters. This is huge. Guys, this is so huge. Ready? <laughs> they speak the language of God. When God speaks, what happens? Genesis chapter 1. Every time God speaks, what happens? He forms matter. He breathes life when he speaks. The descendants of of Adam and Eve leave the garden with the knowledge of how to speak the language of God. Now, under that ability, all of a sudden, they're able to be prosperous and to do things no one else is doing. Because when you speak the language of God, you will always produce life, and you will produce the impossible as the possible. At Babel, I truly believe they were given new languages, and they, they, the, the language of God was forgotten. And I believe that at the day of Pentecost, what happened was we now communicate when we allow the Holy Spirit to operate inside of us. When the tongues came over them, when they began to speak in other languages, they were speaking the language of God. And when you speak the words of God, you produce life. We have been brought back in unity When Jesus died on the cross and released the Holy Spirit to indwell us, we've actually been brought back into unity. Are y'all following me on this? And so what we need to do to walk in unity is we need to begin to pray for one another and speak over each other what the Word says and, and keep each other going and keep in unity. And what's beautiful about this is when we walk like this and allow the Holy Spirit to guide what we say, and to guide how we pray, and to guide what we do, we walk into situations, and the Holy Spirit actually empowers us to speak God's language over them. And when we speak God's words, life goes into the places where there's death. Y'all follow me on this? Let me show you what happens when the New Testament church gets a hold of the Holy Spirit and begins to speak in one language once more. Watch this. The next chapter we find in Acts chapter 2, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came on every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed together, and, and all, all who believed together were together, and all things were in common, and they sold their possessions and their belongings and distributed the proceeds uh, to all as any had need. And day by day, they attended the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. 
And they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising the Lord and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. That is not how people normally act, is it? But that's how people who are in unity, who speak one language, act. And here's what I want to encourage us as a church. Can we begin to believe the best about one another? And rather than choosing fights and arguments, can we begin to pray for one another? And when there's times that we're worried about what's being said and we're not agreeing with what's being said, can we pull one person aside and just say, help me understand where you're coming from because what you're saying hurts me so bad right now. But I believe the best in you that you wouldn't intentionally do this. Could you imagine what would happen in that? Could you imagine what would happen if each one of us were chasing after encounters with God that are so powerful and so deep and so life-changing that, that we can't help but just want to change everything about our lives, and all of a sudden we come into unity? It doesn't matter what kind of misery comes on the world. If God's people come into unity, we will all be blessed and highly favored, and we will be world changers, and people will see in all and the signs and wonders around us. And what the scripture says is our numbers will grow daily. If we will pray for healing, if we will pray for our provision, if we'll turn to the Lord before we turn to modern medicine, if we'll turn to the Lord before we turn to our, our earthly counsel, if we'll turn to the Lord before we turn to Facebook, if we'll turn to the Lord before we turn to our own comfort, and then grow together in unity, what will come out of that will be world changing. The gospel is not hard, guys. The gospel is the life you're living right now. And the Holy Spirit has empowered you to live it in such a way that people want to follow you. The evidence of your life is being seen every day. And if you'll begin to just be mindful now and start to reach out to those who you're calling, and we walk in unity, guys, we're going to see God do powerful things. Y'all with me today? So how do we do this is the question. How do we do this? Mark 16, 15. He says, and then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Does the message your life preach show good news? Does the unity you walk in show good news? Does the hope you carry present the good news? If it doesn't, what I want to say is this. Today, the Lord can restore your heart and your hope. If there's disunity, here's the thing. He will not force you to get along with anyone. This is why a lot of us are struggling right now. There were people who prophesied the will of God, but there were people who refused to obey. And God won't force his will on anyone. Here's the will of God right now. God's will is that you forgive as you've been forgiven. How much have you been forgiven of? Forgive your brothers and sisters in that same fashion. How much mercy have you received from Jesus? Give that level of mercy to your brothers and sisters in, in Christ. I, I think one of the ways that can restore our hope today, and I'm going to pray right after I say this, but listen, one of the ways that can restore your hope, if, you're, if you have a lack of hope, here's one of the things that can restore your hope right now. Give others hope. <laughs> give others hope. As you give others hope, you're planting a seed into the ground that's going to produce a harvest. You want to see life and resurrection alive? How about this? Give life to others today. Unity is not going to happen because you start praying for it. Watch this. Unity will happen when you make the decision, I'll do what it takes to get in unity. Now look, we're not going to unify under sin. We're not going to unify under lies. We're not going to unify under anything but the word of God. Y'all with me? I will bow to Jesus and Jesus alone. So there's going to be some things I stand against. But when it comes to my brothers and sisters of Christ, we need to be unified by what the Word says. What does the Scripture, what did Jesus say? What is he willing to do in your life today? We can unify under that. But it starts with us making the decisions. 
to offer forgiveness, to offer love, and to make the first steps. Even if someone's not being united with you, unite with them. Even when they show you, turn the other cheek and show kindness. Tell the truth. Be unabashed about it. Don't, don't back off a bit. But we can still show kindness and love. I disagree, but I still love you. And I will not accept what you're saying about me as hateful. And I'll pray because I'm going to walk in unity today. Father, I just pray that you bring unity to the bride once more. Holy Spirit, show us the steps we have to take to walk in high levels of mercy and forgiveness, to walk in the truth with love, to walk with power and boldness, to live out a life that is, that is evidence of the gospel in every action, every word, in every behavior. God, whatever it takes, bring us back into unity together. We will take the steps and be obedient in this season. We'll trust you right now. Father, I pray for those who are brokenhearted, who have a lack of hope right now, that you'll begin to restore their hope and that you'll show them that as they give hope to others, even when they don't feel they have it in them, just as the widow who gave out her last uh, oil and her last meal to make, to make a cake, she gave it even though she had nothing. And yet you multiplied it. And so as we have a lack of hope, and we have a lack of, of, of patience. Whatever it is we have lack of right now, let us plant it into the ground and give it to others to reap a harvest that will be powerful. And God, let us chase after you like we've never chased after you before. Holy Spirit, forgive us for the times we've grieved you and we've ignored you. Jesus, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of holding unforgiveness towards other people. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others right now, Jesus. We pray all this right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't ever want to end a service without offering someone the opportunity to give their life to Jesus today. So today, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, I want you to know that he loves you and he wants to do an incredible work in your life. And the first work he'll do is he'll make old things new. He'll kill the sin in your life and remove it and wash you clean and make you a son of his. And, and he will guarantee you eternal life today. You can have the security that God loves you and that he'll be with you forever. And so if you want to ask Jesus into your heart today, will you say this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe you're God's son. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you rose again. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Today I will obey your words. I'll follow you. Today I'm your son. Today I'm a Christian. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.